Sunday Painter. I want to introduce you to an artist you may have not heard of. Abbott Henderson Thayer. In this short video, we will take a quick look at an art just to pique your curiosity to learn about a new art and a new way of seeing. For more art information like this, subscribe to the Sunday Painter and hit the little bell so you know when I post a new art related video. Also, you can leave a name of an artist you would like to know more about in the comments. So, who is Thayer and how learning about their art may change how you do yours. When I hear Thayer's name, I think of angels. Today we are going to learn about an artist that said he was bird crazy. For me when looking at his work, it's like looking at a messy chaotic beautiful movement of color with a solemn emotion with a twist of being off slightly. Let's learn about Thayer. Born in Boston 1849 to William Henry Thayer and Ellen Henderson. The son of a country doctor, he spent his childhood in rural New Hampshire, near Keene, at the foot of Mount Monadnock. In that rural setting, he became an amateur naturalist, in his own words, he was bird crazy, hunter and a trapper. Thayer closely studied Audubon's Birds of America, experimented with taxidermy, and made his first artworks, watercolor paintings of animals. He became a painter of portraits, figures, animals and landscapes and enjoyed a certain prominence during his lifetime. His paintings are represented in the major American art collections. He is perhaps best known for his angel paintings, some of which use his children as models. At the age of 15 he was sent to the Chauncey Hall School in Boston, where he met Henry D. Morse, an amateur artist who painted animals. With guidance from Morse, Abbott developed and improved his painting skills, focusing on depictions of birds and other wildlife, and soon began painting animal portraits on commission. He also taught his sister, Ellen Thayer Fisher, techniques that he was learning. At age 18, he relocated to Brooklyn, New York, to study painting at the Brooklyn Art School and the National Academy of Design. Studying under Lemuel Wilmarth. He met many emerging and progressive artists during this period in New York, including his future wife, Kate Bleed. In 1875, after having married Kate, he moved to Paris, where he studied for four years at the École des Beaux-Arts, with Henri Lehmann and Jean Léon Jérôme. Returning to New York, he established his own portrait studio, becoming active in the Society of American Painters, and began to take an apprentices. Thayer was resourceful in his teaching, which he saw as a useful, inseparable part of his own studio work. Among his devoted apprentices were Rockwell Kent, Louis Agassi Fuertes, and Richard Merriman. In a letter to Thomas Wilmer doing in 1917, Thayer reveals that his method was to work on a new painting for only three days. If he worked longer on it, he said, he would either accomplish nothing or would ruin it. So, on the fourth day, he would instead take a break, getting as far from the work as possible, but meanwhile instruct each student to make an exact copy of that three-day painting. Then, when he did return to his studio, he would, in his words, pounce on a copy and give it a three-day shove again. As a result, he would end up with alternate versions of the same painting, in substantially different finished states. Did you know, Thayer is sometimes referred to as the father of camouflage. While he did not invent camouflage, he was one of the first to write about disruptive patterning to break up an object's outlines, about distractive markings, about masquerade, as when a butterfly mimics a leaf, and especially about countershading. Kind of neat to learn about Thayer. Life became all but unbearable for Thayer and his wife during the early 1880s, when two of their small children died unexpectedly, one year apart. Emotionally devastated, they spent the next several years relocating from place to place. Although he was not yet secure financially, Thayer's growing reputation resulted in more portrait commissions than he could accept. After her father died, Thayer's wife lapsed into an irreversible melancholia, which led to her confinement in an asylum, the decline of her health, and her eventual death in 1891, from a lung infection. Soon after, Thayer married their longtime friend, Emmeline Emma Buckingham Beach, whose father Moses Yale Beach owned the New York Sun. He and his second wife spent their remaining years in rural New Hampshire, living simply and working productively. In 1901, they settled permanently in Dublin, New Hampshire, where Thayer had grown up. It is difficult to categorize Thayer simply as an artist. He was often described in first-person accounts as eccentric and mercurial, and there is a parallel contradictory mixture of academic tradition, spontaneity and improvisation in his artistic methods. 
Thayer manipulated the paint with brooms, scrapers, his fingers, and even a paint tube to achieve his effects. For example, he is largely known as a painter of ideal figures, in which he portrayed women as embodiments of virtue, adorned in flowing white tunics and equipped with feathered angel's wings. At the same time, he did this using methods that were surprisingly unorthodox, such as purposely mixing dirt into the paint, or, in one instance at least, according to Rockwell Kent, using a broom instead of a brush to lessen the sense of rigidity in a newly finished, still wet painting. Thayer was largely surrounded by women, be they his family, housekeepers, models or students. Biographer Ross Anderson believed that in his mind feminine virtue and aesthetic grandeur were inextricably linked, Thayer felt that the press and even other artists contributed to the degradation of women by emphasizing their sexuality, rather than exalting their moral attributes. When he began to add wings to his figures in the late 1880s, he was making more obvious the transcendent qualities he saw in the female subject. Thayer saying, Doubtless my lifelong passion for birds has helped to incline me to work wings into my pictures, but primarily I have put on wings probably more to symbolize an exalted atmosphere, above the realm of genre painting, where one need not explain the action of the figures. Thayer's first use of the theme was the painting angel. The wings were nailed into a board, in front of which his daughter Mary stood. The poignancy of Thayer's imagery was found wanting by art critic Clarence King, who suggested the use of buckets to catch the dripping sentiment. Other critics like Mariana Van Rensselaer were impressed by the serenity of Thayer's vision, and saw a distinctly modern approach in his traditional compositions. Thayer's preference for painting winged figures was not entirely religious. While keeping a foothold here on Earth, his winged figures suggest that humans have the potential to transcend the hard life and fly above our limitations. However, his obsession with painting winged figures, angels and innocent children may have something to do with the fact that two of his children died unexpectedly in the early 1880s. That so many of his figures gained wings may represent hopes he had for coming to terms with loss. He painted his three remaining children over and over again, which you have seen in the video. Understandingly, there was some intense melancholy surrounding he and his wife for some time. Thayer may be sentimental, but the paintings of his children would suggest he wanted them to be strong, triumphant and prepared for any event. Don't forget he did still lives and landscape paintings. The style of his still lives compares well to Edward Manet's textured still lives and the pristine beauty on Reef and Tom Latour's still lives. Like the highly skilled academic painter Bouguereau, he seems to be able to combine the best of the great 19th century styles, neoclassicism, realism and the emotional or dreamy qualities of romanticism. Thayer continued to paint in his advanced years, but he was increasingly subject to fits of nervous exhaustion. At one point he sought entry to a sanatorium in Wellesley, Massachusetts, hoping to ward off thoughts of suicide. In 1918 he again placed himself under a doctor's care. One day, three years later, Thayer, who was resting in bed, asked an assistant to bring him one of his unfinished canvases and his palette and brushes. As he began to work, his hand suddenly stiffened, evidence of a slight stroke. He suffered two more within the next three weeks, then died on May 29, 1921. John Singer Sargent remarked, too bad he's gone. He was the best of them. A year after his death Thayer was honored with an extensive retrospective exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but throughout the 1920s his idealizing tendencies were dismissed as archaic, his use of wings and other allegorical devices considered hopelessly literal and literary. But today, when the modern age has lost its youth, and its brutalities are at least as vivid as its charms, the peculiar blend of opulence and moral nuance implicit in Thayer's paintings is once again finding its admirers. Hope you enjoyed this short documentary, there is always more to Abbott Henderson Thayer and I hope this sparks your curiosity. For more art video and related art subjects, subscribe to my channel, also don't forget to look outstanding and get your quality custom distressed artist tees, the link is in the description below. Don't miss out, you may find something you like or a gift for someone, nowhere else in the world. Be unique. Please leave a positive comment. Have a great day and thanks for watching.